My name is Jenny Coots and I'm your facilitator today. On behalf of the City of Casey, I would like to welcome you all uh, to the forum, um, including members of Parliament Judith Brady and Brad Batten. In our audience today, we have councillors, representatives from business, transport, and the local community. The excellent turnout today is an indication of how important it is to understand the current and future transport infrastructure needs of Melbourne's outer southeastern corridor. Transport infrastructure has not kept pace with the rapid growth within the corridor and accordingly presents many challenges for future growth in the region, as well as existing and future impacts on business and community. We have a number of key business, transport and government speakers here today, including Paul Hamilton, Manager for Transport for the City of Casey, Paul Dowling from SEMA, the South East Melbourne Manufacturers Alliance, Brian Neggett, General Manager of Public Policy for RACD, Damien Ferry, Executive Director of Community in Place for the Department of Transport, and Anita Kerno, Manager, Program Development, Metropolitan South East Region Public Roads. I would now like to introduce Councillor um, Shah Berners, Mayor of Casey, who will do the initial welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. The City of Casey acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people. It is just such a great pleasure that I can welcome you to the Better Roads, Better Buses, Better Trains Forum. This is an important event for our city, as well as the outer southeast metropolitan region, and we are joined, as mentioned, by a number of special guests, which include um, the State Member for General, Mr Brad Batten MP, Judith Ray, who I know is here, who is our State Representative um, for Narragora South, we have the City of Casey Edrington Ward Councillors, Councillor Simon Curtis and Judy Owen JP and her lovely husband Russell, sitting with another woman. <laughs> <laughs> we have councillors and council officers from Cardinia Shire and you're most welcome. We also have our 2011 City of Casey Senior Citizen of the Year, John Douch, as well as representatives from the offices of Laura Smyth MP, Federal Member for La Trobe, Inga Powellich, MLC, member for the South Eastern Metropolitan Region, and Lee Talamis, MLC, member also for the South Eastern Metropolitan Region. Now we are here today to discuss the transport issues affecting our fast growing city and to talk about what possible solutions may exist, as well as to hear first hand from government agencies about some of the plans that are already in place. I'd like to thank and welcome all of our presenters today. From the City of Casey, we have Mr. Paul Hamilton, Mr. Paul Dowling from the South East Metropolitan Sorry, South East Melbourne Manufacturers Alliance, the RACV, Brian Negus, the Department of Transport, Damien Ferry, and from Vic Roads, Anita Kerno. Thank you for accepting Council's invitation to present at this forum and welcome to the City of Casey. I would also like to thank all the community members in the audience today for being here and for being an active part of this process. Being part of forums like this today is a really important step in developing solutions for our transport problems. As we all know, the City of Casey is the largest and one of the fastest growing municipalities in Victoria. In just a few decades, our population will exceed that of those living in Canberra. It's the rapid pace of growth that really makes an exciting place for us to live and work here, with new facilities, new projects and new neighbours all the time. However, with this growth come the dangers of more congestion, issues with the frequency and reliability of public transport services, and more time spent travelling to and from work than spent with our families. We need not only to keep pace with our growth, we need to move a step ahead of it. And to do that, the key issues of the capacity of the Monash Freeway, the bus services and the public transport network across the outer southeast have to be addressed. Hopefully today provides everyone with a clearer sense of the options that lie before us, and how we might achieve these aims to increase our transport options and improve the livability of our city. Once again, on behalf of the City of Casey, I do welcome you all to this forum and I look forward to the productive and insightful discussions that are going to ensue. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Our first speaker today is Paul Hamilton. As Manager of Transport for the City of Casey, Paul is responsible for the overall management of traffic and transport related issues throughout the city. He has been involved in a broad range of transport and land use planning strategies, 
including those relating to activity centres and transport corridors. Paul has been a local government representative on a number of transport sector working groups. Please join me in welcoming Paul Hamilton. within the municipality and within the immediate adjoining areas. The community is telling us that they're increasingly frustrated with the difficulties they face in simply getting about their day-to-day -day activities. We're constantly responding to issues from the community around congested arterials, the lack of public transport, the problems getting to railway stations, and when will a bus be in my estate? Put some context around um, some of the information we provide today, whether it's myself or by others. Uh, this is a map of the Casey Academy Dan on area, southeast of the metro area. Key points that I would highlight uh, the Casey itself is generally is this area here. The Monash Freeway is this corridor coming through here with the rest of the highway. The dark black lines are the railway lines. Thompson's Road is a key east-west connection which will eventually go through into Cadillac. The Casey Residential, this grey area here, is the area of Casey which has developed or is likely to develop in the very short term. And this pale area here is the um, growth corridor which will be developing uh, over the next 20 years so that's really a growth still to occur. Some of the issues we talked about east-west uh, journey work when we're talking about that it's really the case of residence this is down on the down on industrial and the journey to work trip is really this movement through here. So traffic congestion is a a daily challenge that's having real and direct impacts on the quality of our lives. Traffic volumes on the Monash Freeway through the Helm and the, and the Freeway Merge are now at a triple point of failure. Any incident can trip the, park, the, the freeway over to gridlock conditions, resulting in travel times blowing right out of all proportion to what people would, would normally expect. What's even worse is the uncertainty of trying to use the freeway. Um, you never know from day to day how long the trip's going to take. And so people are leaving early and early to try and compensate for that. A recent example that we've had in the last two weeks, a uni student uh, living in Berwick was scheduled for their exams, the exams for the University of Hawaii Hawker Race Course. Um, they left home with their mother to drive in so they could relax on the way in. And they left home from Berwick around 7am. They actually had trouble getting on the freeway. Probably should have made a decision at that point, but they didn't. Uh, they were leaving at seven, leaving at a two and a half hour buffer for a 9.30 exam. The freeway had an incident, uh, became gridlocked, and they got to Caulfield at 9.40, 10 minutes after the exam started. So the student was totally stressed before they even walk in to do the exam. You might say that's a one-off incident, but it's not. It's an incident that occurs regularly. People are trying to balance up whether they can use the freeway. There are limited options for case residents in commuting to work, and people are avoiding the Monash Freeway using Bridge Society, Pound Road, Thompson's Road, but these connections are also highly congested. Another example of uh, a young family living in Casey. Husband and wife, two children, five and two. Both parents are working, which is a typical example of people living in the road area. The husband works in Port Melbourne. Um, that's in town, you think they catch the, the train in. But where he works, there's no bus service. It's a 40 minute walk from the nearest station. The children are in childcare and picking up. 
They try and balance their family responsibilities by the wife or mother taking the children to childcare in the morning and the husband picking them up at night. The husband was working from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Uh, but he couldn't be sure to get back to pick up the children on time. So now he's changed his hours, so he works from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. He has to leave home at 5.45. He still can't get back to pick up the children at 5 quite often. And by quite often, twice a week, he's ringing through to the wife to say, I'm stuck on the freeway. I can't get back to pick the kids up from childcare. The wife has to leave for it. That's impacting on her employer, his employer, the people working in childcare, and, and the children. It's not just the Monash Freeway that needs the upgrades. There's a backlog of Arts Hill Road improvements across Casey, and we've highlighted these in the Casey Arts Hill Road improvement priority listing. Casey's Arts Hill Roads were established when the area was, was uh, basically a rural area. And just to give you a growth that's already occurred, means that most of these roads need duplicating. There's a number of intersections that need upgrading. There are rail crossings that need upgrading. The roads aren't the only story. Public transport also is an issue for Casey. A number of our estates in Casey have been established for over five years and still don't have a bus service. The Marion Waters, Mellington area, Lindhurst, 1,800 homes. Botanic Bridge, 1,000 homes. Cascades and Clyde, 600 homes. Brooklyn Greens, it's 800 homes. None of these areas have bus service. Where they do have bus services, they tend to be very indirect routes. The levels of service are low, the frequency of the poor. Some quick examples of travel times if you look at Metlink and, and Google Maps. If you went from the centre of Cranbourne to the shopping centre of Cranbourne to the centre of Berwick and the shopping centre of Berwick, it's a trip of about 13 kilometres. It's similar to going from Dandenong shopping centre to Huntingdale, going up through the highway. By uh, the Metlink site, various walk, train, combinations, it's somewhere between 50 minutes an hour and 10 minutes. It's 16 minutes to drive. If you're going from the centre of Casey, Casey Central, in the, around the uh, Barron South area, into the industrial area in Dandenong to try and get to work, to get to the Dandenong Frankston Road, Green Road intersection, somewhere central to that industrial area. Again, it's a trip of going from Dandenong to Clayton. Uh, by public transport, it's somewhere between 50 minutes an hour and 10 minutes. By car, it's 15 minutes. Railway car parks are full. There's been a lot of work done in upgrading the car parks, but there's only so much you can do. Local bus services don't match the train timetables. Even a, a trip from Fountain Gate Shopping Centre, where there's a major bus interchange, most of the bus routes go through, to the Mary Warren Station. I was going to a, a meeting in Melbourne the other day, I thought I'd catch the, the train into town. It was easier for me to walk the 15 minutes to the station and try and coordinate a bus through. And the bus goes from next to the office. We'll have a look at the population growth, where are the jobs and the journey to work out that's affecting Casey. The population growth in Casey has been enduring for a significant amount of time and it's been sustained over that period. Ten years ago, there were 175,000 people living in Casey. Since then, 80,000 people have moved in. In the next 10 years, we would expect that same level of development and, and growth to occur. There'll be another 70,000 people on the right. 10 years is not a very long period of time if you're talking about road duplications, rail upgrades, expanding bus services. <coughs> Population in Casey and Hang Up is still 53,000. In 20 years' time, it'll be over 500,000. Coupled with that will be all the growth that occurs in Casey Hang A vibrant and sustainable community needs to ensure that people have access to jobs. And the growth in the population brings with it a natural increase in the number of residents seeking to work. In Casey, it's basically a dormitory suburb. We're full of houses. We don't have a lot of jobs or places of employment in Casey. So people live in Casey, they have to drive or, or move out of the area to get to their place of employment. Even with the new employment plan that's been tagged for fish development, it's most likely that there'll be an increasing gap between the number of people who live in Casey and want to work, and the opportunity they have to work in their local area. 
And the, the two lines that you see there, the red line is the, is the population or workforce growth. The black line is the expected growth in local jobs in Casey. But the issue is greater than what's shown there because a lot of the jobs in Casey are actually filled by people who don't live in Casey. So there's people coming into Casey taking those jobs, which means the people who live in Casey, there's a greater gap between what their employment opportunity is and the number of jobs or the number of people. So where do Casey people, the people who live in Casey work? The dominant movement is into and through the non Monash, Kingston and Knox. It's from Casey. The dominant movement is this corridor along East Wing, around Anon. Around 75% of people who live in Casey and need work, around 75% of them leave Casey and go to work, and generally in that one direction. Around 20% in Anon, about 9% in Monash, 6.5% in Kingston. Similar patterns occur to cut in your areas, but they actually travel right through it. So they take right through Casey and uh, to the same areas, which adds to the, the burden. There's a significant what we call a tidal shift where every morning people are moving out, and if you're coming out to this venue today and came out along the freeway, you might have everyone moving in, in, in towards the town. Uh, and then in the evening, it's the same thing coming back. What it creates is a very heavy load in one direction. And it also highlights the opportunities that if you can actually get people uh, having jobs in Casey, in Cardinia, uh, you wouldn't have everyone going in one direction. You would probably have to move Casey in the network. This is an indication of uh, how people get to work and the choice of uh, a private car or other modes compared to public transport. Public transport for those key locations where, where Casey residents are going to work makes up about 6% of the trip. But if you took out Melbourne, if you took out Melbourne, which has got the uh, heavy rail and uh, uh, high capacity public transport, high level service, take that out of the numbers and you're back to 2.2%. So public transport as a mode for journey to work is not providing the service to our community. So the implications for our Casey residents are that we have sustained growth and that will continue into the, into the foreseeable future. The majority of Casey residents must travel out of Casey to get to the job. There's a lack of transport op opportunities and there is a heavy reliance on cars. Growth areas, by definition, uh, are locations where a significant part of the community are in the early phase of purchasing their homes. They're starting their careers, they're starting their families. They have high mortgages, limited discretionary spending, they travel long distances in their daily lives, and they have a high reliance public, on private cars. This means that they're vulnerable to changes in mortgage rates, and particularly vulnerable to changes in petrol prices. The area that uh, is in the, the future growth corridor, this area which is further out than the established case, and there's no reason to believe that the, the same vulnerability won't occur in, in those areas. The distance we travel, the lack of public transport, means that we have a higher reliance on the private car. And you can see when you compare the car ownership in Casey to the metropolitan average, the households in Casey have a much higher proportion of two, three, four cars, more cars because of their reliance on the car compared to the rest of Melbourne. As a, a, an example, I'm a resident of Casey. I uh, have four adults in my household, I have four cars. I'm in an area which is, uh, I've been in my house for 20 years. Uh, I'm in a well-established part of Casey. I'm within the three, three corner radius of the Berwick railway station. Uh, but it's 1.2 kilometres walk for me, not to the station, but to the nearest bus stop. I have a one hour service. If I wanted to get to work by public transport, which is a distance of 6.4 kilometres, it takes me 12 minutes in the car, using it again the Meklin Cellar, 
to arrive at work at 8.30, I have to leave home at 7.30. Uh, and to finish work at 5.15, the earliest I'm going to get home is 6.21. The long commutes uh, have impacts on their health and quality of life. People leave early because the traffic conditions are suffering very well. They get home late because they get caught up in congestion. They're tired, they don't have time to interact with their families. Preparation of meals becomes compromised, you go for a quick and easy solution of the package meal. And they don't have time to go out and exercise after work. Casey residents have a lower level of fitness and higher obesity rates than the Victorian average. The transport system needs to be accessible for people of all abilities and to allow people to participate in the community. Matters such as location of public transport, scheduling, and the cost are important considerations as many people have difficulty getting out of the community to participate. If people cannot participate in the community, they face social isolation, which can severely impact on mental and physical health. From an economic perspective, the community needs easy access to public transport and an efficient road network in order to be able to get to work. As people are spending so much time travelling long distances in congested traffic, this is adding to the family stress and can impact on family breakdown. People are having difficulty reaching their destination and therefore participating in and access, as accessing community and social activities. Council is now having to weigh up the implications of where it has its community events. Uh, whether there is public transport located nearby. We have a, a, a terrific facility, the Old Chess Factory. It's a community facility located at the Heritage site in the very south area. It's an area that's been established for over 10 years. The nearest bus stop is 800 metres from the venue. And it has a weekend service that varies between 40 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes. It's just not viable for people to use public transport to get to our community events. This has impacts on our community in, in that it's a high cost of living. Transport and job opportunities are affecting our livability. It's affecting our health and well-being, and it's affecting our social and economic participation. Affordable housing needs to be more than the release of cheap housing land packages. And integrated land use planning is more than drawing lines on a map which shows where buses and trains may occur at some time in the future. The state government needs to develop an infrastructure delivery plan that provides better roads, better buses, better trains, incentives for local jobs and other community facilities as and when the community is rolling out. We need better roads. Now, I acknowledge this slide is difficult to see on the screen, but the information that's on it is in the, the booklet that's handed out to you. There is a current backlog of state arterial road projects that are highlighted in, in the booklet. Uh, these include the Monash Freeway, Hallam Bypass Upgrades, Thompson's Road, Duplication and the Connections. It's a key east west connection. Narrow and Cranton Road Duplication and a number of intersections. Estimates of the cost of delivering the current backlog of state arterial roads is a billion dollars just for this localised area in case. That's not taking into account the additional buses that we need the additional train services we need, the likely upgrades of the local arterials that the council's going to have to work through, future connection of Thompson's Road across Cuddy and Creek and Grice's Road across Cuddy and Creek to open up those employment opportunities. This is a very significant backlog and we need funding programs that start delivering these works. We need meters up bus services that are introduced into the new estates as the community moves in. So they're not buying the second, third, fourth car. And link to every train to ensure that people can complete the total journey. It's not just about train frequencies, it's about how long it takes you to get from home to your destination. We need uh, bus services that operate on a frequent basis and seven days a week. Late more early morning to late evening. We need better train services that will include the extension of Cram and East and into the Great Area. We need uh, consideration of duplication of Cram and Rail Line to increase its capacity. And we need our stations upgraded to a premium standard to give people a reasonable level of service when they're using public transport. Rezoning of land for employment does not actually ensure the jobs are delivered 
in the same time frame as the housing. It is very difficult to get the employment development period in any sort of time frame that syncs with the housing. So targeted programs and incentives are required at a state and federal level to help kickstart the employment. So what is Casey doing? We are strongly advocating on behalf, on behalf of our community to make sure that there are state road and public transport infrastructure improvements. We are delivering the local components of the, of the road network. We are developing a strategic blueprint, which is the C21 strategy, building a great city. It's our vision as to how we will see the city of Paris in 50 years' time. That's our target. We're working on developing that. We're developing an investment strategy with the Shire Academia that will attract businesses and increase employment in Casey. And we're investing in future community needs. We're putting in a, a range of community facilities, regional recreational facilities, uh, Casey Complex, Casey Fields. We're putting in community places, kindergartens, return of trial health centres. But in summary, sustained growth will continue for the next 20 to 25 years. And Casey residents will continue to travel long distances to get to work. The existing back infrastructure backlog must be addressed because there's going to be more people coming in. And in conclusion, there is a long lead times for transport projects means we need commitments and planning to happen now. We need an infrastructure delivery plan for the better roads, better buses and better trains as well as other community infrastructure. We need state and federal incentives to assist in local job creation and change in travel patterns. As new growth lands are released, the state government needs to provide the necessary community and transport infrastructure. And the state government has not yet advised council when this infrastructure will be delivered. If the government is not in a position to fund the infrastructure required, then why allow the development to occur in the first place? Thanks for all you certainly highlighted the realities of the daily commute to and around and from Casey, as well as the need for transport infrastructure investment and the need for jobs creation.